there's a beautiful woman taken from you way too soon making love to her in the morning and she's gone by the afternoon the sun sets in the distance there's no one there to hold your hand lay your head down on a chill so pill it will never be the same again the silence of a moonless night is more than you can take pray that you hear whisper your name in a dream oh, good morning how's everyone doing welcome to the month of june june 1st that's the month Hope everyone's having a good morning. Let's see who we got. Monday morning, we got Troy Pike. We got Not Mr. Moon, Scott T. P. Bradley Bethram, Stu Abe. What's up, Abe? Stephen Berry. Facebook, we got Kansas, Vegas, the UK, Wisconsin. What's up, guys? How's everyone doing? Thanks for joining Dallas, Texas. What song is this? This is uh, Blues is a Beautiful One by Floyd Lee Band. Floyd Lee Band, he used to play a lot. He's like true blues, Delta blues, and he used to play a lot in the subway. And I saw him playing this song in the subway back in 2009. Probably the only time I stopped and listened to a band in the subway, like till completion of a couple songs. And then took a picture of the name and then went and found him online and listened to him ever since. Uh, so he came up today, Floyd Lee Band. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hope you had a... a a good weekend, but in a way, I hope you kind of didn't have a good weekend. And we got a fun like lineup of shows today. We got uh, some interesting stories and some fun rabbit holes, but it would feel dumb to not even talk about how bizarre and sad of a weekend it was. It was fucking crazy, man. I stayed up till Saturday night just refreshing Twitter and just kind of crying and, and feeling terrible. And uh, I know no one cares about my thoughts on on, on world shit and uh, big stuff like this. And I just make two minute funny va- uh, vi- baseball videos, but it would feel really tone deaf and 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 poor to not even talk about how fucking crazy everything is right now and sad. And uh, you know, a lot of people that. Uh, grew up with white privilege like me are kind of racking their brain and thinking about all the times and all the interactions that they've had with cops and thinking, Oh shit. And, uh, that's been, it's, it's, I, I'm embarrassed and sad that I, like, it's just opening my eyes this much right now because when I was like 15 through 25, the amount of run-ins I had with police is probably a lot. Like I wasn't a bad kid, but just speeding tickets or getting pulled over and like, I've never had any fear. It's crazy. Um, last summer, I talked back to a cop. I think, you know, I remember a time when I got, we got in trouble because we were drunk, so we were riding bikes to the Jack in the Box. And I lived right by Livermore Labs, Lawrence Labs, which is a top 10 terrorist destination because they they created the atom bomb and all that shit. I lived right by there. We're riding our bikes to the store, to Jack in the Box because I'm drunk. My friend's driving on the road. And he's like, well, do you guys want to ride? So we ditch our bikes in the bushes right in front of the lab, which is heavily protected. They got a button at the lab. You hit it, boop, walls come up all around. Uh, And so we stash our bikes underneath the bushes. So we're like stuffing them under the bushes so no one can see. And then we run because we're drunk and having fun and jump in the car and and speed off the -the jack-in-the-box. When we came back, there was like six cops. Um, I don't know if they had guns drawn. I don't think they did. But... uh, six cops just waiting for us because like it looked sketchy as hell, which it did. And we were just laughing the whole time. Like the cop told me to sit in the grass and I was like, officer, that's pretty wet. I'm not going to sit there. And I sat somewhere else and he just, he just let me do it. And I'm just thinking about all these times and it's crazy that other people just don't get the benefit of feeling safe around cops. And that's fucking shitty. And I'll get to the show because no one cares about this, but if you def- if your first reaction is to set- start a sentence with "but," just know you're part of the problem. And I think a lot of kids who who grew up the way I did don't understand that. Uh, so that's it. That's it. We'll go back to the music. 
I know no one cares what I have to think, but it would feel pretty shitty to not say anything. Blues is a beautiful woman taken from you. Katie loves blues music so much. I play this. I bet she's dancing to it right now. She's She got her guitar. She's learning the blues. Anyway, today on uh, John Boy Media, we got three things coming out. Oh, I still got the RGB up. I'm going to switch that. We got uh, Talking Baseball, John Boy and Jake Radio. Uh, this is wrong. Oh, that's John Boy and Jake TV. Oh, Watching Baggage. Oh, funny, crazy, crazy Watching Baggage that we recorded yesterday. Um, watching Baseball is the Cubs-Brewers game from 2018 where the Cubs were one win away from the best division in the NL, and then they they lose the tiebreaker, then they lose the wild card, and the season's over, and then everyone's talking about crazy, crazy. That was a fun game, though. Eighth inning comeback and all that. Um, and then talking baseball is an interview with Oscar Mercado. Uh, Indians young stud who came up last year, got rookie of the year votes and all that. So, uh, talking baseball, check that out. Um, here we go. The weather, the random city today, the weather is Isle Royale, which <clears throat> Isle Royale <clears throat> isn't a town and we've been doing towns, but producer Luke landed on, uh, I guess, uh, Michigan, it's Michigan, and landed on Isle Royale, and I was, uh, I went down a, a deep, deep, deep rabbit hole of this place on YouTube, so I'll just share some of that with you. It is an island in the middle of Lake Superior, and if you can see the map right here, this border is the Canadian border. And it's really by Thunder Bay, Ontario. And it's part of America because when the Americans won the Revolutionary War, Revolutionary War they took a lot from Britain because they were like, hey, we just kicked your ass. We're going to ask for a lot and you kind of can't do anything about it. We're getting that, that national park, Isle Royale, in the middle of Lake Superior, even though it's closer to Canada. But the reason it was a hot commodity is because it was rich in copper for some reason. So anyway, what blew me away is this is a national park that no one lives on, just an island, and there's lakes inside the island. Look at this. It's a lake. There's a lake over here called uh, Chicken Bone Lake. It looks like a chicken bone. Crazy national park. And, dude, it goes so much deeper up here. It's all shipwrecks, right? All shipwrecks. And then the only people that live on the park are moose and wolves, Basically, check out. Um, shut up. Look at the scuba diver. Scuba diver. Like I got an accent or something like that. They just, uh, scuba divers go here and there's shipwrecks because the, the bay was so choppy. Look at those big ass ships. I was trying to figure out why are the big ass ships in the middle of Lake Superior just, it can't go anywhere. So anyway, look at this. If I had any interest in scuba diving, and being underwater, and I wasn't scared of that, I would definitely go check out uh, shipwrecks because they're basically like an insight into history, like preserved history in a way. But yeah, there's a, dude, this fucking island, I spent so long on the couch just, look at the moose, moose and wolves. That's what they got. And there was this story that the wolves are dying off because, um, that's crazy. Oh yeah. This guy's like the wolf expert, which obviously this guy's a wolf expert. Like if you're a wolf expert and you don't have hair that gently rests on your shoulders, you're not a wolf expert. And I think that's like fair. And everyone understands you can't have a buzz cut and call yourself a wolf expert. You have to have a long, long hair. So, so anyway, look at those bones, the wolves. There's only like two wolves left. And all these moose and the wolves hunt the moose because the ice, the wolves can't get to the island because it hasn't made an ice bridge. So I read up about this and they were like, we got to put some wolves on this island. Oh, that turtle's back is crazy. So they put wolves on the island just to help the wolf pop population because there hadn't been an ice bridge. And then the next winter, there's an ice bridge and those wolves left. So it's kind of like, fuck. 
But uh, yeah, people go to this island and they hike it and there's just wolves and moose everywhere. Look at that. I'm not doing that. Crazy. There's like one cabin. Wheels aren't allowed on the island. And there's this one video of two wolves hunting uh, a moose. And the, they like chase the moose into the water. It's kind of sad if you care about animals a lot. Look at this guy. I mean, that is a wolf expert. Like the most wolf expert guy you can see. Once his beard starts going gray, it's like expert wolf expert. So Isle Royale, it's 50 degrees and mostly cloudy in Isle Royale. And uh, if you're going there, have fun. It seems like a crazy place. I'm not into, I like going on a hike here and there. I'm not, I'm not helicoptering to an island. They say that it's the, it's the national park that gets the least amount of visitors, but the most amount of repeat visitors. Which I think is something they just claim without actually doing the math because they know no one's going to care enough to do the math and check them. Uh, but yeah, so that's Isle Royale, which I didn't know existed, and now I do. And um, maybe some of you guys are from Michigan and, and you go vacation there and you can tell me all about the wolves and the uh, moose that you see. So Lake Superior. Those shipwrecks are crazy though. Like big ass ships. What were they doing? Ice fishing. They used to they used to catch so much fish in that lake that they would they had like a setup and they would ship it to Chicago like that that produced so much boom and copper. There's copper mines from like the 1600s. I told you I was deep into the rabbit hole of Isle Royale over the weekend. Deep. I was like this place is badass. It's cool. Um, but shit, gotta get better with the soundboards. Shit. Let's go back. Rewind 10 seconds. Rewind and... But... And that's all I have to say about that. Random baseball player of the day is Rube Wahlberg. Rube Wahlberg. Rube Wahlberg didn't get noticed and picked up till he was 25 years old. That's pretty late. And... Uh, according to his brother, the scouts discovered Rube Wahlberg when he was throwing chunks of coal at a fence post. And the amount that I believe that is zero. He was probably playing baseball as well as just throwing chunks of coal. <laughs> it's not the air up there, uh, but good movie, but also terrible movie. Uh, he was 25 years old. He gets, they find him in Seattle, Washington, and he's in the major leagues at uh, 27 years old. And according to uh, the thing I read, which according to whoever they got the research from, I don't know. I didn't track it down. I don't know why I started the sentence that way. I shouldn't have. But they say that he was the lefty specialist for Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And I can't think of a more thankless task in all of Major League Baseball. To be the lefty specialist for Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, I think that probably sucked. Let's go look at his stats. Like, he was in the league for a while. Philadelphia Athletics. Then he moved on to Boston. He played from 26 to 40 years old. Led the league in innings pitched one year. Same year he led the league in batters faced. That's kind of cool. 1,248 batters faced. 291 innings pitched with 35 games started and 8 games finished. That's nuts. Uh, but he never got any awards or any accolades or anything like that. He did win the World Series twice. His name is George Elvin Wahlberg. So he's a nickname player. And I actually... Wait, hold on. Let's find... Let's find... Uh, versus Batter. Let's find his stats versus Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Um, they're both Hall of Famers, so that's easy. Let's see, uh, plate appearances, Goose Goslin, Lou Gehrig, Heine Manouche. Who's Heine Manouche? Am I supposed to know that? And Babe Ruth. So he, and Tony Laz. I mean, he's got a, so I was expecting Lou and Babe to be the top here, but first I need to click on Heine Manouche and find out uh, if I'm saying either of the words right that this guy's name is. Hall of Famer. 
So a lot of people are probably like, how does he not know Heine Manouche? I apologize. Manouche crushed, crushed it. MVP. Got a lot of MVP votes. Anyway, so he's a Hall of Famer. So fucking I'm on the Hall of Famer page. Of course he's a Hall of Famer. Jimmy, you didn't need to check that, dumbass. Babe Ruth. Let's look at his stats versus Babe Ruth. Walk, pop fly, walk, pop fly, home run, inside the park home run. Oh, my God, for the babe to get around the bases with the ball not leaving the fence, he had to hit it deep or the outfielder had to take a nap or something. I mean, babe was big and fat and took tiny little steps like a two-year-old that just learned how to walk. It's because he didn't – there's a reason why babe learned to run like that because he was in the orphanage and that's how they ran. I forget. There's some reason why babe ran like that. Um, I think I've lost interest in this. What are the final numbers for Babe Ruth? I mean, Babe had 16 homers off of him. Lou Gehrig had 11. Their numbers are great off of this dude. Why do you keep getting to pitch to them? Did Babe Ruth have more than 16 homers or off anyone else? Babe Ruth's most home runs come off Rube Wahlberg. Why'd they keep pitching him? Doesn't make any sense. Babe had a one dot OPS. Pretty brutal lefty specialist, Rube. Wasn't Rube kind of an insult back then? Oh, 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 oh. Rube, you guys want to see Rube pitch? Because I'm so excited. Look what I found. I found footage of the 1931 Philadelphia Athletics during spring training. And this is Rube's windup. Look at that. That is all legs and limbs all over the place. Just all over the place. Uh, Then they show... This video that like had brand new cameras is kind of crazy. They're going to have Rube show off. Oh, 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 look at that. This is so not interesting, but interesting. The way he picked up this ball off the ground after not catching it kind of blew my mind because now you use the webbing of the glove, glove, you know, and the webbing kind of picks up the ball for you. But the gloves were so different back then that the way he picks this up is he palms it. Like the fingers of the glove aren't involved here at all. Is this on the screen for you guys? I don't even know. Um, Yeah, it is. Okay, great. He like palms it and then just grabs it like a hand. I don't know. It's such a minute detail. I was like, that is not how gloves are used anymore. This is how he throws his. So there you go. Okay. A little four seamer, lefty action. Dirty thumb, fingernails. Whoa. Starts his wind up kind of crazy. All right. On the Facebook live chat, they have subtitles for me. Are they doing a good job? Look at this. All right, let's watch Rube pitch. Just all limbs. So the glove comes up over the head. All the limbs. Look at <laughs> Uh, you know what? Compared to the other people in this video, he's actually throwing the ball hard. Uh, you got to see. Yeah, that's probably not nothing. What a weird wind up. And it's spring training, and they're doing this for the camera. So maybe they're not like going all out. But this video is kind of bad for the people who want to act like, you know. These guys are the same skill levels now, which why would they be? You know, that doesn't make that make any sense. Here's Rube. Look how smiley he is. Oh, they had super slow-mo in 1931 with this camera crew. This video is actually actually wild because you can hear the pitchers explaining how they hold the ball, and then the announcer's doing some kind of shitty 1930s announcer. Look at the catcher, just proper form all around. Underhand catch by, I think that's Mickey Cochran. Uh, hold on. So there's Mickey. Let me, let me find, let me find the, there's one pitcher. I think it's Phil Collins 
Oh, I like this shot because you can see the camera crew filming. Like they cut to the lead at first base. See right there. And I'm like, oh, they staged multiple shots. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, there's a camera crew right there. They actually had two cameras going. They just edited them together. Then they moved them there. Um, hold on. There's this, I think, Phil Collins. Oh, there's Connie Mack. You can hear Connie Mack talk. I was going to clip some of that, but it's rather boring. Um, here's a big dude. Not him. There's a, there's a picture here. There's Phil Collins. Um, that just, I was like, yeah, there's no way that dude's throwing more than like 60 miles per hour. Yeah, this dude. Look at this delivery. If you watch this delivery and, and, and think that, you know, I don't even, I don't even, like, what is that? It's like, uh, like this has to be 70 miles per hour junk baller, but like, like what, what is this? You know, this guy was, uh, was good. Look at like, look, he does that. He does that fucking windmill before every pitch. (laughs) So stupid. Um, it looks like he's throwing a two seamer from from that arm slot, you know. So it's kind of like a sinker ball, but he does the windmill, and uh, I just can't believe that this is this him. He looks look at that glove, man. That's crazy. What are they saying? They said, they said, this seems easy. All you have to do is throw the ball how Phil Collins throws it, and you can earn a big league salary. And to be honest, it does look easy the way he's throwing it. Like, I think that if you drop me, if I go a kid in King's Castle, a kid in King Arthur's Court, you know, and you drop me into 1931 at age 25, like, I think I could do what Phil Collins is doing. And I don't, I don't think that's a, a brag either. I think 75% of you can do it. Like, look at this shit. I don't even, I don't even, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be rude to Phil Collins, but there is uh, zero impressiveness about what he, that, that ball and pitch he's throwing. I mean, let me look him up. Phil Collins, 1923 to 1935. 1923 to 19... Oh, his name was Fidgety Phil. That's great. Good nickname. Led the league in saves. Led the league in home runs given up. Mm. Numbers, I mean, aren't good. And he never put together a full... Uh, 3.86 ERA in that day and age. I don't know. Not impressed, Phil. Sorry about it. I truly hope I don't hurt your feelings. But anyway, this was about Rube. And I think I, I think I said everything I need to say, everything I found. You know, he won some World Series, and he was a lefty specialist that got lit up by lefties. Hall of Famers. So, that's Rube. Wild video. I might do a little breakdown video about that because I also found video of a game from uh, 1930, Babe Ruth's in, and the swings are just ridiculous. They they show a Wally Pip swing, and it might be the most embarrassing baseball swing I've ever seen. But Wally Pip was good. Anyway. And that's all I have to say about that. The story of the day, I've been telling you guys that I've been reading the Wild Bill book by Tom Clavin. I actually got some good reading in this week, which I, this weekend, which I was excited about. And I came across this story in this book, and I don't want to do every single story in this book. Go read it if you want to read it. But it's about baseball. So, bam, got to share it because it's pretty funny. Uh, and we like baseball. So, 
Wild Bill Hickok. Talked about him a whole bunch. He was riding around on the trails. He was already notorious. The articles came out, so people were scared of him, and people wanted to kill him because if you killed Wild Bill, you killed the best shot in the in America. Wild Bill was like the most famous person alive, basically. Um, you know, think about it. There's only one magazine. Everyone read it. So anyway, he's in Kansas City, all right? Hickok was back on the trail before winter could fully set in. Do, 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 do. Um, wrong page. Jimmy, you dumbass. Uh, do, 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 do. He was 30 years old. Wild Bill had walked into hundreds of saloons, including remote ones like this, and encountered strangers. That is not the story. It's a different story. That's a story where he won a brawl when it was four verse one. This is the story I want to tell you guys. Um, oh, I thought this was a funny line. With a good-natured grin, Hickok tolerated the ribbing he received for being possibly the only man in Kansas City who bathed every day. So that's kind of, you know, they were just like, hey, dude, you shower every day? What are you, some sort of loser? You're disgusting. <laughs> Why don't you shower less? So that's odd. Wild Bill, real good skin. Anyway, one of his lesser-known exploits at the time was on a baseball diamond. In Kansas City, a ball field at the corner of 14th and Oak Streets. This was the home of the Kansas City Antelopes, the first baseball team in the city. It had been organized by the attorney D.S. Twitchell in July 1866, three years before the Cincinnati Red Stockings were recognized as the first professional team in the United States. So we're talking about the Cincinnati, uh, Kansas City Antelopes before any like real baseball teams, but it was just, you know, every town had a league and, and like, you ever watch Mystery Alaska and they have the, the Saturday game? It was like that. That's what baseball was. It was re- truly America's sport. Um, and every town played and every town went and played and watched people play. It was like you know, one of the only forms of entertainment. The Antelopes Park had no grandstand or scoreboard and patrons had to sit on benches in the hot sun. Still, every Saturday afternoon, people filled in to watch the new sport. One of the spectators when he was in town was Wild Bill Hickok. He played pickup games with local youngsters before games, and one Saturday he was asked to umpire an Antelopes game. So you got the best sharpshooter. They called him Shootus in the world. Killed a lot of people. Would put on shooting displays just so he could let people know, like, hey, I ain't lost my game. Throw a tomato can up. He put 14 bullets in it just in case anyone wanted to test him and think he got rusty. So, like, every time he went to a town, he'd be like, throw that dime in the air, son. Split a bullet on the dime. Okay, I'm going to go gamble. Don't fuck with me, or I will split you like that dime. Something like that. Um, The reason Wild Bill, of all people, was asked was because the weekly contest had a habit of descending into brawls, especially if the umpire ruled on a play against the antelopes. There was no gun play. Guns weren't allowed within the Kansas City limits. But fists, boots, bottles, and even the occasional knife were employed to dispute the call with fans of the visiting team and the cowering umpire. So, I don't want to just straight up read to you guys. That's weird. On this particular Saturday, the Antelopes were hosting the Atchison Pomeroys. Um, And the visiting team had beaten the Antelopes on their home turf, so there was a riot, and the game was canceled, and then the only way they got it back was they had Hickok agree to be the umpire And when the first pitch was thrown, he was behind the plate with what passed for umpire's gear. Then Hickok also wore, thanks to a dispensation from the city fathers, his Colt six shooters. So Hickok's back there with his long ass hair and probably dressed like a, like a dapper dude who was all bathed up, you know, being clean, like some sort of asshole with his guns on his hips, umpiring a game. Uh, The game played to its completion. No brawls. Uh, The Antelopes won 48 to 28. This was when pitchers had to throw underhand and it was really just hitting. And uh, the whole entire crowd cheered the umpire afterwards, which probably hasn't really happened since. And I just wonder how well Wild Bill like knew the rules. There wasn't a strike zone. Did he have to like brush up on the rules or was he literally like, you guys call all the plays. I'll just make sure you don't fight. But kind of funny to have a famous... Like the most famous guy in America at the time, basically, besides the president, umpire with guns on his hips. And then just leave. Imagine if he became an umpire. Wild Bill was like, nah, I like this better than being a sought-after shootist. I'll just be an umpire from now on. Should celebrity umpires? That'd be kind of wild. 
Some independent league should have that. Some independent league should have that as a promotion. Like have have a pseudo celebrity come ump the game <laughs> and then see how well they do. Uh, that'd be pretty wild. You put like, well, Paul Rudd loves Kansas City. Go put Paul Rudd behind home plate for an, for an inning of some independent Kansas City League and have him be the umpire. I'm sure people will come watch. Some player will get really upset. This is serious. This is my future. You have a joke. But I'm all for it. Celebrity umpires. Has that been a thing? Has anyone ever done that? I don't know. Anyway. And that's all I have to say about that. How long has this been? Longer one? Oh, we're only at 30 minutes. I'll do a little Q&A and look at the, the chats and all that. Um, I'm sorry. Did you say 48 to 28? Yeah, the, the Antelopes won 48 to 28. Um, is this pre-recorded? No. Not pre-recorded. Windmill is for show, says Abraham Rimmery on Facebook. Probably, but I probably think the windmill delivery they thought was actually uh, good, you know? Like, I think they thought it meant it, it generated power and speed. Didn't Will Ferrell play for, like, 10 teams? Yeah, Will Ferrell did that in spring training. When was that, 2013, where he went to every single minor league field and played every position besides catcher, I think. Have Will Ferrell ump. But I don't want it to be a comedy show. Like, I don't want Will Ferrell to be umping and getting in fake fights and, and fake arguments. I want I want a celebrity out there putting in their best effort to ump a game. And I want the crowd to judge him accordingly. Not just going to agree with every call because Paul Rudd made it. He may be wrong. Do you think there will be trades this season in the MLB? No, I don't. I think it's I think the union's not going to If they ever finally agree, the union's not going to agree on uprooting families and uprooting lives from like city and city in the middle of a pandemic. And and it's a shortened season anyway, and I kind of like the idea of like, hey, you you are who you are, you have your taxi squad, you have your minor league, you have your 40-man roster or whatever it's going to be and and this is it and play. So I don't think there's going to be trades. Um don't forget about the hollow Mickey Mantle book I sent you. I did forget about that, Garden Guy, and I'm excited if that's coming, but I did forget about that. So thank you for reminding me not to forget about it, and I'll try not to forget about it in the future, but I did already forget about it, and I apologize. Um, all right, I think that's all. We got a big day today, I think. I don't know. Let me check the recording schedule. I know we have a company meeting today. I know that uh, it's last week's schedule today. Oh, we're going to try and record some watching baseball or some laughs at 10 o'clock. We have an all hands meeting at two o'clock talking yank voicemail episode at four o'clock. So that's kind of it. That's kind of a light Monday. I'll try and make some breakdowns. I think we have some in the chamber. Um, have you watched a show bar skins about colonial Canada or read the book it's based on? I have not. I don't, I have not been searching for a new show. I started watching the Epstein doc and I still have to finish Grant. Um, and I still have to finish Everwood, which I don't want to, but like, if I don't at this point, that's kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a, it's on me. Barskins 2020 based on the novel by Pulitzer prize winner, Annie Prowks. Barskins follows a disparate, group of outcasts who must navigate brutal hardships, competing interests, and tangled loyalists at the crossroads of civilization in late 1600s France. Bar skins. Is it good? Episode two is titled, titled The Turtle King. So maybe I'll check that out. Bar skins. All right, I'll, check, I'll look into the trailer and see if I like it. Um, sol- okay, solid history show so far. Cool. Danny Harrison on Facebook says, anyway, baseball teams will go belly up during the shutdown. Yeah, I mean, a lot are going to be messed up. Belly up, I don't know. But, you know, if the value loses moving forward, you may see that. 
there's a lot of independent league teams and a lot of minor league teams that are going belly up and looking for new ownership and stuff like that. I know that. Um, it'll be crazy, man. It's a hard hit. It's it's a really hard hit for some teams. And, you know, they made crazy profits the last five years or so. But how well do they, you know, businesses spend what they make usually. Rich people spend the percentage of money that they want to spend. It's their right to spend money when you have it. And then when this happens, doesn't matter how much money you have, like you're, you're, your payments are going to get fucked. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think some I think some some teams are going to like be really hurting from this. Especially teams that teams like the Astros because the Astros have a high payroll and I don't think their TV deal is incredibly lucrative right now and they make a lot of money from the gate and the revenue and the fans like the last couple of years their fan base they sell out every game they buy all the merch they support like crazy because they've been good and uh so like they have and they they put that back into their players which is respectable they have high payroll but i think a gate is a bigger percentage of the astros money and revenue than tv deals where places like in high in big tv markets the deals are better so yeah certain teams you know the rays uh don't have a big payroll they don't make a lot of money from the gate. They make all their money from TV deals. A lot of people watch Rays games on TV. Um, they're probably doing just fine. So it, it all breaks down to how these teams, what the splits are and stuff like that, and it's all different. But it's crazy. Troy Pike says, you forgot your intro. I did. I always forget the damn intro. This is for me, not for you. I'm telling you, these rabbit holes were good today. I was on the couch just like, Whoa. Royal Island or Isle Royale is a cool place. I don't want to go, but I want to watch drone shots and I want to watch footage of other people going. And then the Wild Bill story is cool. And then the footage of the 1931. Well, good show. Well, good Monday show. All right. Oh, that was loud. All right. I'm out. I got to... Uh, Blues is a beautiful warm I don't really got to do anything till 10, but... Maybe make a breakdown. Anyway, thanks for hanging out with me. I'll be back tomorrow morning. Cool. See you guys. And she's gone by the afternoon. The sun sets in the distance. There's no one there to hold your hand. Lay your head down on a just so pill. It will never be the same again. The silence of a moonless night is more than you can take. Pay that Julia whisper your name in a dream. Oh, before you.